Hi, I'm Will Bishop, and today we're exploring OAuth Essentials for Frontenders, the first part of our series on authorization and REST APIs for front-end developers. In the first part of this series, we'll provide developers with the context and confidence necessary to start incorporating OAuth into projects of their own. You'll learn how OAuth is used and how it can help you bring your apps to the next level by opening the door to access third-party APIs, which often require OAuth for authorization. Upon completing this module, you'll understand the various OAuth flows, you'll be comfortable with the format of the authorization code grant type, and most importantly, you'll have the knowledge to generate an access token of your own. The next part of this series will build on the OAuth foundation covered here and focus on REST APIs. The final part of this series will then take us into a deep dive of a front-end app, leveraging everything covered in the first two parts of the series. Before we dive in, let's quickly walk through today's five learning objectives. First, we'll cover OAuth 2's role in front-end development and why it's valuable. Second, we'll walk through the various OAuth 2 grant types, or flows. Third, we'll master the authorization code flow specifically. Fourth, we'll put all this in a front-end context. And finally, we'll generate our first access token using the authorization code flow. So what exactly is OAuth and why does it matter when it comes to front-end development? Let's explore this now. First, OAuth is the industry standard protocol for authorization when it comes to making REST API calls, and OAuth 2.0 is the latest generation of this authorization method. It makes sense then that if we want to bring external or third-party technologies into any of our applications on behalf of our app's end users, we'll need a way to be granted this permission. And this is exactly where OAuth 2.0 comes in. Even in front-end development, we might be tasked with a way to incorporate some of our end users' favorite tools like Miro, Zoom, Google, and more. Let's look at a basic example from a front-end perspective. Here we have the landing page of a virtual collaboration platform called Butter. We can see from the Butter UI that it's a fun, visual platform with a lot of emphasis on the front end. But aside from just this, it's a tool that incorporates and integrates several other platforms on behalf of its own users, essentially bringing lots of great, separate tools into one easy UI. Taking a closer look, we can see the logos for some of our favorite tools. For example, when you go to a specific workspace, you'll notice the login with Google option. Most likely you've seen the login with Google option lots of other places before. But in this context, it's a great example of a platform, Butter in this instance, bringing the power of one of Google's best tools, Google Calendar, right into its own UI and experience. When you click on the login with Google option from the UI, you'll enter the Google OAuth 2.0 authorization flow as an end user, granting permission to Butter to pull details from your Google Calendar and bring them directly into Butter's platform. This is a great example of how seamlessly OAuth 2.0 enables us to bring amazing third-party capabilities right into our own applications. With this in mind, we're really starting to see why mastering OAuth 2.0 is so valuable for front-end developers. In this sense, it's more than just an authorization method. It's truly a launchpad for bringing more external capabilities into your app to complement the native ones you've already built. Now that we've set the scene, and we have a better sense of the value in leveraging OAuth 2.0 in front-end development, let's dig into some of the essentials and build a technical foundation. First things first, a couple of reminders. Keep in mind that the bulk of the OAuth 2.0 flow is handled on the backend or server, with the exception of the end user triggering the flow from the front end, which we'll cover shortly. Second, note that most secure sites and services don't permit cross-origin resource sharing, or cores. This means that any requests to an OAuth endpoint and other REST endpoints must come from your back end. Keeping these points in mind, let's discuss the various types of OAuth flows in a bit more detail. OAuth 2.0 supports various different flows, or what you'll see referred to as grant types. It's important to know that there are a number of different flows for handling OAuth authorization, but some are more common than others. We'll get into this in just a second. Each of these flows share the same basic fundamentals of OAuth, which is that they mostly include these four components. First, there's a resource owner, the entity that owns the data in the resource server. So, for example, a Miro account owner is the resource owner of their account. Next, there's a resource server. This is essentially the OAuth term for the API that stores data that an application wants to access. So, using the same example, this would be a Miro-owned API. Then we have the client. This is your app, the thing that is requesting access to some kind of data. And lastly, we have the authorization server. This is the OAuth magic, aka the main apparatus that enables the OAuth flow. All right, so we've covered the main components of OAuth and mentioned that there are various different flows or grant types that can be leveraged. 
But which one should we use? Well, ultimately this will depend on your exact use case and the needs of your application, end users, and the infrastructure available to you. But for the purposes of covering the essentials from a front-end perspective, we're focusing primarily on the most common flows. You will likely see these two flows, or grant types, referenced for OAuth quite often, the authorization code flow and the implicit grant flow. Since the authorization code flow is one of the most commonly used and one of the more secure flows, we'll consider it the recommended flow for incorporating into our applications for today's purposes. So far, we've talked about OAuth's role in front-end development, we've covered the various flows from a high level, and now it's time to start mastering one of the most common OAuth flows, the authorization code flow. Let's jump into it. First, end users will need to authorize your application. Next, an authorization code will be exchanged for an access token. We'll retrieve an access token and refresh token pair, which will enable us to make an API request to one of the resource owner's APIs. Lastly, we can request a new access token using the refresh token returned in step three. These steps are helpful as a high level overview, but let's break it down a bit further. Here we see the detailed steps of the OAuth flow broken down between our end user, our app, and the resource owner. In this example, we'll refer to Miro as the resource owner. This is a lot of information though, so let's take it step by step. First, our app will construct an authorization or installation URL. This is how your OAuth flow will be kicked off to the end user. Next, we'll direct our user to this URL and they're presented with an authorization screen on the front end. When the user accepts this prompt and authorizes the app, they'll be redirected to your app's callback URL. This callback URL will contain an authorization code parameter, which your app will exchange for an access token and refresh token pair. The access token is what will be used to authorize requests to the Miro REST API or whichever API you're using. Once the access token is used, you can request a new access token and refresh token pair using the original refresh token that was returned when we exchanged the auth code earlier. We'll pause here for a second and reflect on each of these interactions between the end user, your app, and the resource owner. It's quite a lot. So far, we've spent a bit of time looking at the authorization code flow from end to end. But in order to contextualize this a bit more from a front-end development perspective, let's check out a real example. More specifically, let's start from the very beginning, at the moment where the OAuth flow is initiated by an end user from the UI of a web application. We'll start here with a very basic front-end UI built in a Next.js application. As we can see here, we've got just a white screen with a sign-in button. You can use your imagination to picture a more exciting front end. Once an end user clicks sign in, this will kick off the OAuth flow and they'll be redirected to an authorization page managed by the resource owner on our back end. In this example, we're using Miro and you can see that our app is constructing an authorization URL based on a Miro client ID, client secret, and a redirect URL which is specified by the developer. Here, we're using Next.js serverless functions inside the API directory on the left. We'll speak to this in a bit more detail in a minute, but for right now, let's just focus on the code itself. Once our authorization URL is generated by our backend, let's jump back to the front end to see where the URL takes us. Here, we see that our authorization URL brings us to an authorization or consent screen hosted by the resource owner, Miro in this instance. Once the end user authorizes the app, a call is made to our application's backend or in this specific example, one of our Next.js serverless functions. Here, we handle the redirect and parse the authorization code from the redirect call that hits an endpoint in our app. Once this is successful, we then execute the code to exchange this authorization code for an access token and refresh token by making an API request to the resource owner's OAuth endpoint. In this specific example, we store the access token and refresh token in the cookies on success. All right, we've gone through quite a bit right now. But don't worry if you still have some questions. We'll go through this flow from end to end in just a moment. But first, let's take a moment to call out some of the benefits of using a framework like Next.js, which provides us with the serverless functions and saves us a bit of time by removing the need for setting up a formal server. Let's call out some of the main facets of this example in Next.js, starting with the serverless functions. Again, these are a feature of the Next.js framework for functions included in the API directory. These functions allow us to make API requests directly from these .js files within our app saving us the time of setting up our own server instance. In contrast, if we were using a framework like React, for instance, we would want to leverage an express server or something similar to listen and handle this part of our OAuth implementation. 
Next.js serverless functions also allow us to more seamlessly save our OAuth access token directly in the cookies without having to worry about passing these between our backend and our frontend. And lastly, this setup allows us to avoid certain things like cores errors. Now that we've walked through most of the foundational aspects of the authorization code flow and added some context around how it's triggered from the front end, let's take a closer look at an end to end example of generating an access token. Here, we have the front end UI of our application open on the left hand side in our browser, and we have our text editor open on the right hand side, showing our Next.js application. We'll start by first getting our project up and running by running yarn dev. Once our project is running, we should be able to access our front end on localhost based on our local environment configuration. First, let's highlight the signin.js file that we're leveraging to construct our OAuth authorization URL. You might remember this was step one in the authorization code flow that we covered earlier on. This is taking place here in one of our serverless functions in Next.js. You can see that we're constructing the URL based on the resource owner's domain, with a response type parameter equal to code as a standard for the authorization code flow, and including a Miro client ID and client secret also provided by our resource owner, Miro, in this instance. We're also including a redirect URL in the construction of this authorization URL, and this is what tells our application where to direct the end user when they authorize. Now, let's take a look back at the left-hand side of the screen. We're at localhost 3000 in our browser, and we just have a basic sign-in button like we showed earlier. Now, when we go ahead and click sign in, this calls the signin.js serverless function in our Next.js app and redirects us to the authorization URL that we've just constructed. In this instance, the authorization URL starts with our resource owner's OAuth installation or consent modal. When we click add, we're authorizing the OAuth flow as an end user, and we're then redirected back to our app's callback URL, the same as the redirect URI parameter in our OAuth configuration. In this case, our callback URL is our redirect.js serverless function in Next.js. So, you'll notice that not much is happening in our front-end UI on the left-hand side, but actually all the OAuth magic is taking place in our back-end, or, in this particular instance, serverless functions, to authorize the user. We can see if we take a look at the console, we've actually logged an access token. So we know our authorization was successful, but how did we get here? If we take a closer look at the redirect.js file in our application, we can see that when this function is called after the end user authorizes, we first check to see if an authorization code was successfully generated on redirect from our OAuth flow. That happens here in line 8. On success, we take this authorization code and include it in a subsequent request to our resource owner's OAuth endpoint. Specifying the grant type as authorization code, our client ID and secrets, this new authorization code, and our redirect URI. We send a post request, and the response will include an access token and a refresh token. We can see this here in lines 15 and 16. In this specific example, we're also storing our access token and refresh token to our cookies on success, and we're checking for the presence of those cookies to determine if an end user is authorized or not. The latter portion of this is taking place in a separate file called authenticate.js. We won't get into this right now, but you can also check by viewing our browser's cookies from the developer tools. If we go to the application tab, and we refresh, we'll see whether or not those cookies were included. And we can see here that we do have an access token showing up in the cookies, and it should match the one that was also logged in the console here. If we were to clear these tokens, we would no longer see just a blank page, but actually we would see the sign-in button once again by going back to localhost 3000, because no longer are we authenticated. If you're interested in seeing the full repository that we're using here, you can also find this on our GitHub repo, which we'll share at the end. While it's quite helpful to see this flow demonstrated end-to-end, -end, there are a few considerations to highlight. First, on production you would likely want to add some additional layers of protection, such as encryption, storing your tokens in a database, etc. Second, as mentioned earlier, this example makes use of Next.js's serverless functions. Another typical implementation for this kind of app could include setting up a formal backend and server, such as Express.js, and handling authorization or API requests entirely on your backend. We've covered a lot at this point. From OAuth's role in front-end development to generating an access token, we built a solid foundation for understanding OAuth and knowing how to implement the authorization code flow. Here's a quick look back at what we've covered. First, OAuth is a launching pad for bringing more capabilities to your apps. Second, the various OAuth grant types, or flows. Third, the authorization code flow, specifically. Fourth, a front-end and back-end view of the flow in Next.js. And lastly, an end-to-end -end generation of an access token. And that's it. 
If you found this module on OAuth Essentials helpful, the next part of this series will build on the foundation we've laid here today, focusing on leveraging REST APIs within front-end applications. The final part of this series will then take us into a deep dive of a front-end app, bringing together everything we've covered in the first two parts of this series. Interested in seeing more content like this? Follow us on YouTube for more developer tutorials and join our developer community on Discord. See you around. Thank you.